Another hand of applause for our reverse engineers. Right. Um, it may contain some traces of assembler here. Uh, if you're allergic, uh, use your antihistamines, okay? Uh, a bit of background. Um, there we go. Uh, so it seems like many of the same faces from the previous talk are here, but there are some new ones. So we're going to repeat in different words what motivated Frida in this talk. Um, and it's uh, so. For the new faces, Frida is a dynamic toolkit for doing uh, instrumentation of other processes. You could think of it as a library for building debuggers, and it also comes with some pre-built tools for doing process inspection and modifying and playing around in, different, in, in, in a different process and programmatically inspecting and writing scripts that uh, interact inside another process. Um, and we did this uh, for several reasons, but foremost, which is not even on the list because it's uh, a great hack, hack value for us personally, uh, but it also might be useful for somebody um, for using for interoperation, especially if you have, as we said in the previous talk, some black box software. You don't have so, uh, the source code. You want to look into it, what, see what's happening for several several reasons. You might want to imp interoperate with it. You may want to want to integrate with it somehow beyond the integration points that have been given to you by the by the vendor. And another is compatibility. There might be a spec, uh, and there might be an implementation. And in a few cases in the history of software, it has happened that the specification, the implementation actually is not the same. So for these very few cases, then Frida might be, be useful for, for, for looking at what the implementation actually does, which is what you have to deal with anyway in practice. Uh, and in those cases, some micro-level reverse engineering might be, might be useful. Uh, another uh, use for it might be might be more generally design recovery. So you have basically doing some, some piece of soft software archaeology, if you will. Uh, you have a piece of old binaries and you want to, there's no way to get the source anymore. And you want to recover a specification, write up you, what you think, what it does, and then re-implement it again, or uh, because you want to read file formats, for example, from old, for an old game or something like that. And uh, uh, when we started Frida, there was also a lack of dynamic reverse engineering, e engineering tools, at least we felt that that was the case. Yeah. So the, there is a bunch of very nice static reverse engineering tools, basically, that can take binaries of software and dissect the binaries, and you can look into the binaries, see what's happening. But uh, what FreeDIES does, which is very different from that, is that we, we look at what happens inside your computer while the software is running. So, so that, that's a different way of, of doing reverse engineering. So then the design goal sort of falls out from that. Uh, we want to be able to live inspect other processes without having access to the source code, without having debugging symbols compiled into the software. So it bears mentioning that we're talking a lot about binary, sort of traditional compiled static language style software here. Uh, some Perl people might be uh, reacting to that, but that's software too. Uh, and we want to inject our own agent, say, uh, D, let's call it that, into the remote process P. And we don't want the remote process P noticing that we're doing it. Uh, for several reasons. So, so uh, various kinds of int uh, software, uh, closed source software has design goals of their own that want to limit your ability to inspect what they're doing. Uh, so if you were a slightly older guy with a long beard, you'd perhaps say that that was infringing on your freedoms. Uh, that you might be political about it, you might not. The reality is that you might need to do this for various kinds of reasons anyway. And once you've in, uh, integrated or sort of injected into this remote process, then you want to communicate in there and have your own sort of agent running in there so you can inspect things. So that, that, that's the basic setup of Frida. That, that's the basic architecture. We're sort of making a network connection, if you will. Actually, that's actually what we're doing inside a remote process. And then we're using web sockets and XML RPC norms. We're not. Uh, we <laughs> we're using a protocol to communicate in and out there. Yeah. Uh, for the, uh, curio the curious, we're using peer-to-peer -peer DBUS uh, over a transport-specific protocol, uh, which is a named pipe on Windows, a Mac port on Mac OS and iOS, and uh, FIFO 
5 is on TCP. Uh, uh, yeah, 5 is on uh, Linux and Android. Yeah. So, so this gives you a, a communication channel so that you can inspect and modify and, and basically do whatever in there because you have a Turing complete runtime in there. Uh, and it turns out that what we squeezed in there was actually a dynamic language. We'll get to that. Um, and we can send commands in, in, in terms of programs inside this remote process, and then we can play around quite a bit because we have our own runtime uh, with various kinds of, of library helps. Um, and as I mentioned, we want to avoid these anti-debugging defenses, or traditional ones at least, uh, so that we can look it into software which, which might be less sort of amenable to, uh, to debugging. So the, the plan of attack, how we do this thing, is that uh, we do injection. So we uh, insert our own custom logic, our scripts, into the remote process. And then we use this logic that we have there to do interception, to trap function calls, to set breakpoints at the beginning of functions, if you will, in the remote process. Um, and then we want to do ins instruction level uh, breakpoints and debugging. Uh, but we don't use the normal operating system facilities for doing that, because then we will be detected. So what we're actually doing, we're taking the software that's in there in the remote process, and we're recompiling it on the fly by disassembling it, changing it the way we want to, inserting all the debugger logic live as, we, as, as it executes uh, so that we can communicate with the stubs that we place around every instruction to get full control of what's happening. And the side effect of this is that it's extremely fast compared to normal sort of instruction level step debugging because you don't have a context switch. Um, and it also, so far, avoids all current anti-debugging products that we've uh, run up against. Hmm. So, first part, injection. Um, at this point, I'm going to do a quick show of hands again. Uh, so, uh, if I say things like process, people are comfortable with that. Memory space, heap, stack, I'm going to try again, threads. Still people comfortable with threads here. Wow, that's scary. Uh, FIFOs or files? OK, uh, great. Memory mapping, so it's OK. OK, so then very quickly here then. On the far right is the debugger. That's basically what you build with Frida. So the Frida REPL or Frida command line tool what would be a debugger in our terminology. Um, uh, it's, it's an instance of a process as well. It has a communication channel with a debuggy, the pro program that you want to debug. Uh, and the program that you want to debug has a couple of threads usually, uh, has a memory space, which is the green part, has some memory that's consumed, if you will, or mapped in that memory space, like the heap and stack, has uh, memory mapping of its binary code, like the uh, program itself, a.out, libc, libp thread, libqt, whatever. Uh, and the threads might be executing in, in these various uh, parts of the program concurrently. So, so our game plan for injection into this remote process, so we, we're basically, we're on the right hand side, we want to do something with the debuggy on, in the middle here. And the injection game plan is to create our own dynamically loadable uh, binary, it's an SO file, which contains our agent, if you will, that's the custom logic, part of the custom logic is the runtime that we want to inject into the remote process. Um, and we do that once, so we have, let, let's say we made this SO. I'll show parts of it to you in a little bit. Then we hijack the thread in the remote process. This is sort of Linux specific. You could do similar things on other Unixes. We do a different strategy than this on other platforms, but the gist of the plan of attack is pretty much the same. But uh, the details here is, is sort of Linux specific. So we hijack the thread in the remote process using something called ptrace. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and once we hooked a thread, basically we have control over this particular th thread from outside. We can use that thread to allocate memory inside the memory space. We can squeeze some bytes into that memory space. Uh, and these bytes are going to be binary code. And this binary code is going to be a bootstrapper. So uh, this bootstrapper then is going to do the rest of the lifting. Basically, it's going to take the SO file, open it 
find the main function of ours in the SO file, execute it, and it's going to do that on a newly, freshly made thread. And that's going to be our environment there. So we're going to create a thread for ourselves that we can do whatever we want with. And we're going to load our runtime into this thread. And then we're going to communicate with this thread. And we're going to, at that point, we can, the original thread that we hijacked, which was one of the threads running in there, we're going to hand back. And they will be none the wiser. That's the idea anyway. No, not, not well, we do that at the very end, but we don't do that while we're running. Hmm. We'll, we'll get to that part. Um, but in general, uh, so, so yeah, so the question is, you free the memory at, uh, that you've allocated. And yeah, we, we eventually we do that. Uh, and we are very careful about cleaning up everything that we do uh, for various kinds of reasons. One thing is that if you want to reattach, you don't want, especially on embedded devices or smaller devices, then the memory overhead by reusing memory and memory and memory every time you attach to it might be a problem. Secondarily, uh, it's um, you might leave the software in a somewhat unstable state unless you do <laughs> proper cleanup. Hmm. Now, it's likely that you leave the software in a very unstable state anyway, <laughs> but still, that, that, that's your part, not ours at least then, I mean, as a user. So the relevant APIs for Linux then is ptrace. So it's a, it's a system call that you can um, use as a basis for debugging. Uh, it's process tracing, so you can talk, so you can access a remote process somehow and, and interact with this process from your own process. Um, and memory mapping, so it's about uh, making the green parts in my diagram a different color, basically by uh, mapping files or devices or something else into memory. And then we need uh, the ability to open symbolic, so uh, dynamic libraries. So uh, it's, it's kind of like a class file loader in a different language, say, or modules in Python, whatever. Uh, you open this SO file and you can find the symbols inside there and you can, you can call into those. And uh, we use the Unix signal handling mechanism uh, for a few things so that the remote process that we're dealing with don't, doesn't screw up too much. Uh, if, if, if something unexpected happens, then we can actually, well, we can see what's happening. It's, it's a way of communicating be between processes in this case. Well, we'll get into the de details. Okay, so I said that we are going to show you the, the SO file, and that's the start of it. It's pretty obvious what it does, so I'll, <laughs> I'll just move on um, to, to the interesting part where we hijack the thread in the remote process. So this is this is what we do with, with ptrace. And uh, we're not going to discuss error handling here. The code is blissfully short without it. <laughs> with error handling, it's going to be much bigger. But basically, we, we attach uh, to a p process ID, uh, and we wait for a signal back saying that we have actually attached to this particular process ID. Uh, so this, this, we're going to check the status field to see that the status we get back is the specific status that we wanted. We could, in theory, actually get a different uh, message on that PID due to various kinds of race conditions, something else being signaled. But, uh, but once, once, once the wait PID returns, then presumably we have actually attached. Uh, and then we get the registers of that. So that has blocked a particular thread in the remote process. And then we, we can read out the registers for that particular thread. And we're going to use those later again when we want to resume it. So we just remember the state of the thread, mo mainly the registers for now. And then we're going to squeeze those back in again a bit later when we want to resume from whatever it was doing. So now, we have a stopped thread in the remote process. Uh, and what we want to do is to do a memory allocation there in the remote process. So again, we make another copy of the registers, which is incidentally going to be the same as the last one. But um, we're going to use that as a template for modifying a few registers, because now we're going to execute a function call inside the remote process. So we were sort of we want the remote process to make a function call or simulate a function call, uh, which is going to be a, a little bit tricky. So um, 
and the function call we're going to make is to mem mmap. Um, and the resolve remote libc function does quite a bit of hairy stuff to determine what the memory address of mmap in the remote process is going to be. But basically, on Linux, there is a way to look at all the memory maps of a process. So if you go to proc self maps for your own process or proc PID maps file, then it's going to list all the mappings. And you can look at the mappings and you can see if you can find the libc mappings, eh? Because that's where mmap is going to live. And then you can read out the base address of that particular dynamic library in the remote process. So if you map this function, so if you map libc in your own process, presumably you're going to get the same. There are a few corner cases here. The the remote process might be running in a, in a jail with a different base of libc with the same name, which has a different layout. Then Frida's is going to crash. Mm -hmm. So we're actually assuming that the libc we're seeing at the file system path is the same as the remote process is seeing at the file system path. If that's the case, which it usually happens to be, <laughs> because you, you control the environment usually of, of where you run the process, then you can map the libc function to your process you can look at the mmap function in your process, and you're going to compute the delta between the, where the mmap is and where the beginning of, of the libc got mapped into your process. And you're just going to subtract the two, you get the delta, and then you can squeeze that on top of the base in the remote process. So this is actually simple. It boils down to simple arithmetic. Uh, but there is a few steps along the way. And then, once you have that, then you have to know the calling conventions, in this case, on 64-bit x86 of how to call the mmap. So uh, the mmap takes a couple of arguments. One is the size that you're going to mmap. In this case, it goes with in, in RSI. Uh, so we're going to take two pages. Uh, each page is 4,096 4, uh, bytes usually. Um, and we want the page to be readable, writable, and executable. The last one is going to be important because we're going to put some code in there. So if we didn't get the executable, it would cra crash when you call it. Uh, and it's private and anonymous, so it's, it's not available to other processes. I can't actually remember what the zero argument is at, the po at this point, the RDI. Uh, the file descriptor. Yeah, right, okay. So we're not going to map it to a file descriptor. Where? Oh yeah, yeah, right. We, we get we get to that. Yes. So the uh, so the yeah so the RA okay. So the return value of a function when mmap is finished, it's going to uh, give us a return value in RAX. So when a C function returns, it can return one value, uh, and this value is going to be always in the RAX register. It's extremely unlikely that the address we're going to get is one three three seven. So we use this as a magic marker. Uh, so, if for some reason, we, we get to that in the point, but, but if, if this hasn't changed, then nothing has happened over there. So, something must go, be going wrong. Yeah, because we're, we're putting the instruction pointer at the beginning of the function, as if the call already happened, and we're putting a fake return address on the stack, so that when it returns, it, we will trap with a seg fault, the seg fault. Yes. And, yeah. Right, so we cannot actually perform a call as such. Uh, we're going to trick the instruction pointer in the remote thread to think that the call already has happened, and it's going to res resume. Well, we'll get to the next slide. Um, uh, we're going to say on the stack, the RSP part, uh, that uh, there are going to be a dummy return address, and the dummy return address is to some some place where there is a, a, a trap, an int three, I believe, right? Hmm. So, so the, the oh no, uh, it used to be, and now it's just an invalid address. Okay, right. So some way that that things are going to blow up in there, and we're going to be able to catch that blowing up. Uh, and then uh, we modify the various kinds of registers with the arguments that mmap would expect. So we're going to set the registers again. That's happening on line two. And then at this point, we're going to continue execution over there. Now, continue might be sort of a bit of a stretch because we changed everything and then we're not actually continuing, we're, we're doing something new, but that doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that, that means that the thread in the remote process now uh, executes again. When it executes, the kernel will do a context switch back into the thread over there using the regs, regs that we just set. 
which may means that it's going to resume execution at the very beginning of the mmap function with the stack being set up and with all the registers being set up the way it they sh must be. Then it's going to continue out towards the end of the mmap function. Then it's going to return. Then it's going to hit this dummy return address. Then it's going to blow up. Hmm. Uh, and then it's going to trap. And that's what we're doing with wait of, uh, Frida wait for channel si signal. So waiting for a trap there. And then we're going to get the registers back again. And at this point, we're going to read out the return value of mmap, which is now, as I said earlier, in the RAX register. Uh, and that's going to be the, the, the memory address that mmap over there created. And we're going to remember that for later on. Easy peasy, right? Any questions? Alex? So if you have packs enabled, this won't work because you won't find a map. So address um, uh, space randomization in. Yeah, it's gonna work. Mm. Yeah, it's gonna work because uh, we're just uh, we're not giving a map an address to a map path. We're just uh, telling it map anywhere, wherever it's convenient. S yeah, but yeah, right. So the 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 the. the the pack is not going to change the address of the mmap symbol itself. No, yeah. Exactly. Beca because we will we'll be able to read out the base address of where libc was matched, if, if that was the question. Okay. Right, so the, uh, use the mic, please. Address space uh, random in the uh, ALSR, thank you. Uh, means that uh, we load each library in a random location, but uh, the the books on that bookshelf are all going to be still in the same space. Mm. Right, exactly. Uh, so since we're able to read which random address the library actually received when it was loaded, then we're in a good state. And I have a follow up. I had a question. Okay. So now I have the mic. <laughs> um, so uh, is is this uh, similar to? Um, the way some certain malwares operate when they inject into uh, processes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this ptrace technique is, um, the bad thing about it is that if a debugger is already attached, you're not going to be able to attach uh, because we need this shortly. Uh, but uh, there are other techniques, and uh, a future version of Frida will probably use a different technique. So are you going to, is it detectable? The ptrace is basically something that uh, the other process may yeah. block you from doing? Hmm. It can just p trace itself, like have a. Yeah, the that's a there typical technique. Uh -huh. there can, it's kind of like a Highlander thing. There can only be one p tracer, <laughs> and if the process p traces itself, that slot is reserved. I see. And and so, is there a technique for getting around that? Then can you can you do this without p trace? I think the best is to not. Yeah, exactly. To not use p trace. Uh, How would you? So, uh, yeah. Th that's a, that's a research topic right now. Uh, uh, I heard about a technique. I haven't. I don't know the details yet. Because a, a friend said, oh, I, have, "I have a proof of concept. I'm going to show it to you," and I haven't seen it yet. But, but there are all the techniques as well. You can, of course, uh, you can patch. Um, uh, you can use a proc, and you can uh, write to its memory where you know it's going to execute some code later divert execution. You can do crazy things, but or you could write a kernel driver. Uh, I think Google does that for their, they have some injectors uh, that lets you inject Python code into Python processes. But yeah. Well, I guess you could also run it in a virtual machine and uh, modify things there. Mm. If, if you really, really need to instrument a black box process. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, so, um, if you did those things, then this story would be pretty different. Um, this one is easy enough in the sense that it uses uh, known debugging APIs provided to you in more or less their intended way of use. Um, now, uh, w so far, what we've done so far is that we actually allocate memory for the bootstrappers. We have a, we have a memory strip in the, um, in the remote process, and now we have to populate this memory strip. And uh, what we're doing is that we're generating some uh, binary code for that. So that's that's architecture specific. So we have a generator for um, 
for a 32-bit, 64-bit x86 and ARM. Um, and the pseudocode for what's going to happen, we're going to generate two functions. One is the function that creates a thread. So basically, create, so this, is, this is what you do in a operating system class, playing around with, with learning how Unix works, I suppose. You open the thread library, you get the uh, thread create function from this library as a function pointer. So now we have a function pointer called thread create. Then we call thread create uh, where, uh, with, with, a, it with, with a memory or an address where, where the worker thread information is going to be placed uh, and with a pointer to the function that's going to execute when the thread is um, running. And that's going to happen at bootstrapper plus 128. So the code that we generate here is going to be at the beginning of the memory strip that we, going we generated. And at 128 bytes later, we're going to generate a new function, which is to going to be the, the actual function that gets ex the first trampoline function that gets executed in our thread when it gets made. Uh, and then after we've done this, we're going to trap, uh, basically signaling back to um, uh, our external process that, that we've, we've actually accomplished something. So uh, this is the code that gets executed in the thread when it's created. So this is the callable that you supply in a new thread in a Java API, say, or, or a similar thing in Python, the function that you squeeze into the new thread. Uh, Perl is probably the same. So, so what happens is that the first thing we do is open a FIFO path. Uh, and that's the way we're going to do some communication with the outside process. Uh, the outside process being Frida in this case, or your sort of debugger command line or whatever you want to build. We're going to write one byte to that um, FIFO path. In this case, we just pick the, we have a string already in here. So we just pick the first byte of that string just to reuse something. Uh, and uh, we then, open the uh, dynamic library. Um, we look up the main function in that dynamic library. We call that main function with an argument uh, that allows us to get some dynamic information into the main function of a library from the outside. The, the only other way there are other ways you could do that. You could sort of modify the binary just before you squeezed it in with this particular information. But that, that's one way of communicating with it. Once, so, so this, this starts executing uh, the, th this is basically where we start up our V8 engine. And then there is a main loop in there and, and things start happening. At some point in the future, it's going to finish. And then we close the FIFO and then we tear down everything uh, and, and we, we clean up all, all sorts of mess. Um, so, so now we have this memory strip. It's divided so far into two parts. The first 128 bytes, which was basically starting a thread and executing something. And then the next few bytes starting at offset 128, which is basically going to be the trampoline that starts executing the main function inside the SO file that we load. So how do we execute this thing? We basically did what we did last summer. We get the registers again. We say that the IP address, so the, the instruction pointer, is now going to be at the beginning of the bootstrapper sequence. Um, and we, <laughs> we need a stack. So we're just going to take the end of the two pages that we allocated, hoping that we're not going to use all that much recursion. Uh, uh, and we're going to set the stack pointer the, to the other end. So then we have about. 790 something bytes on the stack before we smash up the code that we're going to execute. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's going to work out just fine. <laughs> um, yeah, and 4K plus that. Yeah. Um, and then, then we set the registers and then we continue. Uh, and then we wait for the trap again. And the trap is going to be this trap at the end, the int3 there. Basically saying that I've successfully I think I've successfully created the thread. 
uh, and the thread then will open the FIFO and then will squeeze something out on the FIFO and then you can listen to the FIFO to see if the thread that started actually does is up and running. Easy, right? Questions? Uh, there's also a nice property of using a FIFO is that if the process crashes, well, we know about it. Uh, or if it's closed to it explicitly, it's the same scenario. So right, so, so, so the FIFO tells us that the remote end is now disconnected. So if something happens over there, we know that it's no longer going to give us any, unlike email. Uh, <laughs> you get this uh, timeout, yeah. Okay, so um, at, at this point, uh, we have our own thread in the remote process executing. Uh, it started whatever we wanted to put into the binary that we gave on, on the, uh, the, the dynamic library. Uh, and then we just had to make sure that this dynamic library that we load in there uh, does something sensible so that we now can communicate with it. Uh, so now what we want to do is hand back the original thread that we hijacked. Uh, and then we take the saved registers that we, that we used uh, there are a few minor details that also happen, but basically we, we reset the instruction pointer on everything so that it, the, the original thread hasn't noticed, except for the time that has passed. Hmm. Uh, it, it's dif very difficult to detect what's happened. Right, so there, there's another point here. So hmm. the thread, the, the process would also be able, to, so the point, point is and the two he said, and the two pages that we allocated. Um, yes, uh, it, it would be possible to detect those, and it would, of course, also be possible to detect that now there's an extra thread in there. Uh, and you could also theoretically, I mean, you can also check that there's a mapping of a library that you didn't expect. Hmm. So, so those are, so far, the th three, uh, should I say, clues that a reasonably intelligent detective running inside the original process might be able to, to catch. So it's not that we don't have a footprint, it's just that it's an arms race and then they would have to somehow to detect us going on yeah. in, in there. And on Mac we do um, manual mapping our library uh, because of sandboxing issues where uh, a process can't actually DL open because it can't read from the file system where we are. So uh, we manually map into the remote process. And we, longer term we would be doing that on all OSs. But then we're sort of replicating the dynamic loader. Yeah. So I had a suggestion for them during the break, and that was that the two of them should play hide and seek inside the processes of a computer using Frida, both of them. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm, I'm very quickly going to go through a sort of visual presentation of what we just did. Um, so we have the Frida on the right, we have the debuggy on the left, and things are sort of at, at at rest. Uh, then we create the Frida agent file that we uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, we hijack the thread in the remote process using ptrace. We um, uh, allocate a memory strip. Uh, we populate it with a bootstrapping code. We then use the thre thread that we hijacked to execute the bootstrapping code. The bootstrapping code starts a new fresh thread called Frida. The Frida thread starts executing the code that we populated on our strip there. Uh, this code, uh, and, and it also opens a FIFO, um, and it not notifies the debugger that over the FIFO that we're actually progressing, so it's sort of, sort of like a progress bar kind of thing. Uh, and then the bootstrapping code inside the new thread um, loads the agent SO file, uh, and once that's done, and it calls the main function, and once that's done, we hand off Concurrently, we hand back the thread, uh, the original thread, to the operate, so the the, um, the original process, and it continues. Uh, and so, it seems like a linear thing here because it's difficult to show things in parallel. But but these few last steps actually happen in parallel because of multi-threading, uh, and we execute the entry point in the agent. Uh, and basically, at this point, we're done with the injection part. There was a comment. Oh, right, so uh, th it turns out, so the, the question is, why don't we free the pages at this point? Uh, well, it, it turns out that uh, when the main function inside of Frida agent uh, is finished, it has to return back to the a few uh, last couple of instructions that are on this page. Mm. And since the total amount of code is less than 4K, there is no point in allocating two pages and freeing one of them, so we just keep one. Okay. Next step, interception, or inception as the case might be. 
Um, the basics here, pretty simple. We have a function f that calls the function g. Uh, and what we want to do, so that there is a caller, the f, there is a call e, the guy getting called, g, and there is a call site, uh, the site in the f function f that the call actually happened. Uh, what we want to do is to inject um, a pre function before that happens, uh, um, in more or less invisibly, so that we can look at the arguments. That, that, that's basically the callback mechanism that we showed you in the in previous talk. That, that's how this, this is implemented. So for that to work, we have to find the address of the function of interest, generate a small trampoline uh, for, for calling the purple function. Uh, we want to. Re we need to replace the first function of the original call. First instruction. Yeah. First instruction of the original, uh, of, of of the target call, uh, and we use the trampoline to do the call to the function that we actually want to do. Uh, we'll show this in a more more detail. So, finding the address of a specific function inside of a remote process is pretty much what we've sort of said so far. We, we now we're now inside. We have our own runtime running inside the remote process. We don't have to do the, the P trace tricks, play the P trace tricks anymore to do remote calling. So we can do everything in process. So then we look at proc self maps, which gets the mapping of all the libraries. We look at all the SO files that are there. Uh, we parse the ELF formats so that we could find all the symbols of the files that are available to us. And we find the base address for the code segment of each module. This is when when uh, Andrea showed you the ability to to look at uh, well, various kinds of tab completion. In a sense, it's it's similar to that. And uh, when you hook functions like like hooking the draw text stuff and changing the uh, uh, OSDC uh, stuff that we said before, this is the mechanism that runs behind that. Uh, and we, if we do find the symbol that we want, then we basically com compute the address of it. Uh, Based on the, based on what we think, what we parsed from the ELF format and from the base where the, we know that this is loaded in memory. So it's the same trick as we used before. Um, still with us? Sleeping? Okay. Good. So um, the initial conditions for the in interception might be that we we have a call site here. It calls the function called decrypt frame. So that, that's the F, if you will, that's, that's the original function. And uh, then we want somehow to be able to look at what's happening when decrypt frame is being called. So the, the beginning of decrypt frame looks like this. So the bytes at the left is basically the, the wonderfully uniform uh, uh, instruction set of x86, uh, in this case, 32-bit. Uh, so, um, and, and on the right-hand side, basically, it's, it's uh, assembly code. So the first thing here uh, on the decrypt frame is, is, is the typical preamble in most, uh, most compiled uh, C code, uh, where we modify the stack a little bit and get some arguments out of the stack and into registers. So what we want to do is, uh, conceptually, we want the call to go to our trampoline. The trampoline is going to make sure that we don't muck up the stack too much uh, and save all the registers and every, everything. We're going to boot up, in this case, or well, call into the V8 engine. Uh, so then we can execute all sorts of JavaScript that we want to. Once mm -hmm. the JavaScript has can, uh, finished executing, we restore all registers so that it doesn't seem like we've done anything. And then we're going to return to the original decrypt frame, possibly with some registers changed, if that's what we want, or just without leaving any trace. So that, that's, that's the concept of what we want to do. So uh, we start with generating the trampoline. Uh, the save registers and restore registers is it's, it's quite a bit of sort of low-level x86 details to get everything there working properly. We have some stack manipulation having, we need our own stack because we don't want to scratch, uh, modify the stack uh, of the original program for various kinds of reasons. Uh, details can be had at request. Um, so the next step is that we have, so, so we have the basic trampoline, it looks like this, but we have to prepare the ground a little bit because our strategy is to modify the decrypt frame function. So we take a couple of instructions from there, stuff it at the end of the trampoline, and then we jump back to the decrypt frame, and we'll show how that works, uh, uh, at the end of these few instructions. Uh, so um, 
then the flow is going to be this. The call happens is still going to happen to the beginning of the decrypt frame function. So we're not actually going to change any addresses at the call site. We don't, we don't touch the call site. We touch the target. Hmm. We rewrite the target. Uh, and the first thing we do, we just replace the function there with a jump, which doesn't modify anything uh, except the uh, IP, also the instruction pointer. Uh, that gets to our trampoline. We save all registers. We do the JavaScript stuff. We restore uh, registers and stack. And then we, we continue by executing the original instructions in the decrypt frame. Uh, until we get, we, until we executed as many instructions as we needed for our jump call, uh, and then we continue executing at that point in the decrypt frame. So we sort of split the original function in two parts, take the header out, squeeze it at the end of the trampoline, and then go back. Mm. Easy uh, peasy. Uh, the only tricky part here is that instruction, some instructions are precision dependent, so we have to rewrite them when we copy them. We can't just copy them as they are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So far. So n n the last part I, we're going to talk about is, is stocking, and and this is where we do instruction level dynamic recompilation in order to do instruction level debugging and and and, and, and tracing. So uh, we're going to use the same mechanisms that we've talked about so far, namely interception, and then we're going to take the s binary code and take it apart uh, and reassemble it again. Uh, the way we want it. That's that's the basic that that's the basic idea, and we also have a different tool that we make use of when the stalking happens. It's called a relocator. Uh, yeah, it's what I talked about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't want to go into all the details because that, that that gets really tricky. But let, let's just keep it at the explanation we have so far. Um, so this. Let's say we have a max function that compares two values and returns the higher of the two. Uh, so the first thing here is it compares two registers, EAX and EBX. This is 32-bit uh, uh, x86. Uh, so if uh, one is greater than the other, uh, then it's going to jump to a, a register, so offset number six, which is the return. Uh, so then, in, in, in this case, if EAX is the bigger, then we're just going to keep EAX, which is going to return, incidentally going to be the return value, because that's what the uh, specification says for all functions. If not, then we have to swip, swap them. So we use a stack, say, to push and pop, and we move some registers. Uh, so that this is just a very tiny, simple, illustrative uh, function. So the first step we are going to do bec be so that we are able to do dynamic recompilation is to identify the basic blocks. Mm -hmm. So a, a basic block is basically a strip of, of instructions where there is no branching going on. So it, just, it doesn't jump out of the block. And it doesn't contain a target of anything else either going back into the block. That's, that's the basic definition of it, at least. Once we have done that, we wrap the first basic, each instruction in the first basic block, we wrap with uh, instrumentation code. So the instrumentation code is basic, this is actually the debugger itself, if you will. This is the replacement of the operating system breakpoint functionality. So we, for every instruction here, we could possibly end up communicating over TCP, if, if that's what you <laughs> wanted to do. Um, or you can do it based on only so certain instructions you're interested in. Yeah. And yeah. you only pay the performance penalty for those. Yeah. So we, we are able to invoke the V8 engine for every instruction. For every instruction happening here, we can actually call into JavaScript with everything that happens in there. You can do whatever you want, and then you can return back and do slowing, thus slowing down your program. Um, so, so the instrumentation happens both before and after the compare because we have to take care of the stack and flags and everything so that it should be invisible, what we're doing here. Um, and the post, in this case, uh, you could imagine we should also basically instrument the jump function or the jump instruction. But the, the, the branching instructions we have to deal with very specifically because they make all sorts of weird changes to the instruction pointer and stack. So that's why... We what we're actually doing here, we're sort of weaving in coroutines, if, if people have been playing around with that. So we have, um, we have a, the, the stalker that we call it. 
we weave into that every time we have a branch happening in the program, and that determines what happens next. Uh, so at the end of a basic block, we get back to the stalker. It does magic stuff uh, and figures out where it's going to go next. So in this case, uh, the stalker says, well, we're either going to, to, to jump to instruction. So, we, so the, the next possible instruction at this point is either going to be three, push EAX, or six, depending on the flags that have been set. So then the stalker has to emulate the function of the, the jump greater instruction, has to know what to look for. Uh, and uh, yeah, Actually, yeah, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't go into technical. Well, if you can do it in two minutes, that's uh, fine. So uh, we, we take that jump and we, um, uh, we make two, generate code for the two cases, uh, and we just jump. So into the stalker for one case, into the stalker for the other case. So then, then the, the stalker then, at, when when, it, when we get to the stalker, it, it is able to inspect the states that we that we sort of accumulate so far to see where it's going to go next. So at this point, we haven't actually touched the stalker. Has never seen three, four, five, and six. It doesn't exist in the world of the stalker yet. Um, so it's only not until you actually get to the point where it sort of stalks and decides that it's going to go to address three. Say in this case. Uh, it falls through, so the, the sizes are so that the, the EBX is bigger, we have to go to three because we have to switch them. Uh, at that point, the stalker reads the, uh, the next basic block and it transforms the next basic block and makes sure at the end of the next basic block it gets called back again. Uh, so then we execute the basic block, uh, thus, and uh, towards the end you get, it gets called back, uh, and, and that's basically the, the, the main loop of, of the stalker. Just process one basic block at a time, and it does a bit of caching so that it doesn't have to recompute every, uh, every uh, basic block every time. And I think there's a yeah. least recently used part because it could be very big. And if you have. Yeah, it, has, it does dynamic rewrites backwards. So if there's a static jump between two blocks, it will be able to do a direct jump. Uh, when it starts trusting the code of that block not to change uh, right details. So you, you can imagine you, you can imagine this is very fun with with a certain kinds of code so there is basically self code modifying code that might be looking at itself and modifying itself so we have to be able to deal with that hmm. uh, there is self checking code that looks at itself and does a checksum to see if anybody's modified it so if you did sort of static reverse engineering and modify the binary and you load the binary it's going to do a self check at the beginning so we have to deal with those kinds of things. Um, there is code that access the instruction pointer. So basically code that calls the next instruction. And then that, that's the best way, I guess, of, of getting the contents on the instruction pointer on the x86 now on the stack. So if we detect those kinds of things, we have to sort of squeeze and modify the stack so that it looks like it was in the original place because we are some completely different location hmm. when we actually execute it. Um, and we have to make sure that none of the flags are modified, none, none of the stack seems to be modified because there are all kinds of weird <laughs> things where, where, where the stack, I mean, it's not only the stack that has been used so far that sort of protected, it's also it's part of the stack on some architectures that goes below the sort of, the, the mm. fresh stack that you would be consuming is also assumed to be non-touched. Hmm. Uh, red zones. So-called red zones. Uh, so there are all these sort of, trips and hurdles that uh, have been accumulating in the ABI uh, that, that we have to deal with. So, but we're not going to go into those details. If you really are interested, you can talk to us and use this, uh, look at the source code. Uh, but, um, see we're nearing the end here. Um, so basically what we, sp we spoke about so far is the ability to intercept, in inject um, system inside a remote process. Uh, catch all function calls and use this kind of technique to do instruction level debugging uh, by interjecting a sort of coroutine based debugger inside your remote process if you were so inclined. And that last part is what you saw. If you were here at the previous presentation, you saw that in the CryptoShark demo app that was using this stalker. For yeah, that was looking at, at the execution of, of, of the threads picking up all calls, just following the program as it was running, picking up all calls, looking at various kinds of calls, cataloging the calls into various kinds of 
groups. So mm. calls related to file functions get the f uh, sort of get the file tag. Net network gets the network tag. IPC gets the IPC tag, and then we use these tags to label the threads to see which threads are doing which things. So if you have a sort of hundred, well, that's perhaps a bit too, too much, but ten or twenty threads in a, in an application, the, and and you might you might want to know which thread is actually doing the networking because that's what I'm interested in. Then this is the mechanism that, that allows you to do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we use the intercept interceptor to intercept the API calls, and then we use a stalker when you say you want to follow a thread. Is this on? Yeah. So w one of the nice things you can use for the case when somebody's saying this ought to be outlawed because it can be used as a is actually one of the cases that is a legitimate desire of the user is to be able to check that the software they're running from some closed source supplier doesn't do sneaky call home things that mm. actually they, the supplier had no right to do that and it is a violation of my privacy. Mm. Um, your ability to, to track that, you, you can do exactly that against, you know, you, you're, you're enabling the owner of the computer to verify that their computer is not being compromised by something that the supplier of the software has mm. not admitted to them. Absolutely, this is this is getting at least in our view. This is even more interesting to do on the mobile devices. Hmm. Um, so, so could I have a comment there? Is like you could potentially use this for sandboxing the application as well. So, like stubbing away, saying that yes, hmm. you're allowed to run, but these certain things, no, 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 you don't touch those parts of my file system. Hmm. Yes, yeah, a absolutely. Um, so you get you get an extremely fine-grained uh, way of doing sandboxing. Uh, I mean, you, you could even, you can even imagine uh, throttling various kinds of functions as well, uh, just mm. by returning at the beginning of a function if you didn't really want it to happen. Or you, I mean, um, so, so mm. one, one way I, I, we were thinking about this early on is that sort of, it, it gives you a way of doing aspect-oriented programming in compiled binary code. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the cool thing is you can also simulate network conditions. Uh, you don't have to set up a lab where you're uh, um, re replicating some network scenario with firewalls. You can just do it inside the application and you can see how it responds to it. You know, So you can use it for testing your own products. Uh, yeah, logging code in your own product. You have your own logger on the side and stuff. Yeah, many use cases. So do we have any further questions? I guess we're done with the presentation. Uh, thank you for a very fascinating talk and um, a pleasure. Two talks, fascinating, and thank you. Okay.